Welcome to the world of Animal Allies, the doctors, volunteers, pet owners and other surprising visitors who are out there making a difference. In the UK, animal doctors have a tough job dehauling a herd of cattle. While in Australia, animal helpers fight to save the home of the smallest kangaroo in the world. This week's How To has some practical advice on helping your goldfish live to a ripe old age. And Animal World investigates the mysterious South African rock hyrax. The Animal Allies vets from Hampshire in the heart of England have the not so pleasant task of dehorning cows. Dr. Celia Newlove has a large herd of mature cows. While on another farm, Dr. Martin Andrews has the same job, but a less physically demanding one, with only three calves to dehorn and a student vet assisting for the day. The first step is to separate the mothers from their calves. Then the men move the calf into a squeeze chute. This restrains the animal's head and ensures the safety of the calf and vet during the procedure. Dehorning involves burning off the calves' horn buds, which can be quite painful. But sometime before the procedure, they will be given an anaesthetic. Cows use their horns as weapons in competition for food or when under threat. Dehorning prevents injury to other cattle and farm workers. Doc Nilav is not so lucky to have any help. Her patients are hefty and she has more than 20 to get through. It's going to be a long morning, I think. It's a physically demanding job. Dehorning ideally should be done when the animal is young, as it is a more painful procedure when they're older. So it's really the same principle as the calves, in that you put some local anaesthetic in to the area where the nerves are passing. It's not, they don't, they sometimes seem to feel it a little bit. Some of them have an extra nerve supply coming around the back of the horn, so they sometimes do struggle a little bit. No? Oh, don't find anything there. Dr. Andrew's job is made even easier than first thought. But this one is, is pulled, it actually hasn't got any horns. Occasionally they're born like that, depending a bit on the breeding, really, so it uh, hasn't got any horns, so we don't need to do it. Okay, the next then? calf, Dr. Andrews shows the student vet where to right, inject the anaesthetic so. so the calf doesn't feel okay. a thing. So, we're feeling along this ridge here, and basically halfway along there, going towards the horn bud, is where you want to inject. This calf's got quite. Uh, so, in there. Are you basically. fanning the injection around as you go in? Um, yeah, you spread it around a bit as it goes in, really. So we'll give them a minute or two then when that's worked we can uh, take the buds off. Oh, she's going to be light. So. On my own, it's a bit hard. While an anaesthetic will block pain during the procedure, the cow will be a little sore post-operation. Horns may seem like dead tissue, but they are actually an extension of the skull and contain many nerves and yeah. blood vessels. Just draw back to check you don't inject it into the blood because that uh, could actually stop the heart with a local anaesthetic. Dr. Andrews holds an electronically heated iron dehorner over the horn bud for a few seconds. It works by burning the skin at the base of the horn where the horn growth occurs. The horn bud should fall off in the following weeks and never regrow again. Good. Okay, that's him done. That's all done. So what we have to do is try and get the horn as low as possible. Um, I mean, sometimes they, they do grow back a little bit, but um, at least they're not going to be quite as long as these. These are ones that he's actually brought in, because he normally, all the ones without horns are ones that he's homebred, so these, that's why they weren't done as youngsters. And basically, we just have to put the wire on and go for it, really. Older cattle with larger horns require a different procedure. Doc Newlock uses a saw wire to cut through the horn. Well, 
relying on the heat generator by the wire to actually seal the blood vessels. The secret is to keep going, because if you stop, you just get stuck. In the first time, you see there's like a sinus, and basically it will attach with some of the sinuses in her head. But you can see that as a result of the heat, there's no bleeding at all. So that's one side done. Dogs love those, eh? In Animal Doctors Part 2, the student vet gets his chance to tackle the task and Doc Newlove takes the bull by the horns. Think of Australian animals and the kangaroo jumps to mind. But this is also a member of the kangaroo family. It's the woylie, the world's smallest and rarest kangaroo, and it's under threat. Foxes and feral cats have hunted the woylie and other Australian marsupials to near extinction. But scientist Mark Glukakis and his team from the University of Western Australia are fighting to change that. The thing about the woylie is that if you came to the Perup 20 years ago, you probably have a fair bit of trouble finding one. The Perup is a nature reserve in Western Australia. Here, the fox has been eliminated to give animals like the woylie a chance of survival. They have introduced a predator control program to control introduced foxes into the Perup. And lo and behold, the woylies just started breeding like woylies do. They're, they're always pregnant. So they can produce many young over a very short period of time. Over a year, they might have four young and they started increasing to the point where you'll see woylies all over the place in the, in the Perup. To ensure the animal's long-term survival, Mark and his team continually study and monitor the woylie. First, they must set traps here. to Some capture the nocturnal marsupial. Yeah. Convenient spot. Obviously a good site for the traps somewhere in there. You can imagine if you're, if you're doing 100 traps in a single day, um, what you're trying to do is save as much time. Um, you can, if a, a trap's going to be in an arc of 180 degrees somewhere in there within a 10 metre arc, you can waste a lot of time looking for a trap or um, the critical issue is you could lose a trap. And if you lose a trap, it suddenly goes from trapping to death trapping. A bait made up of oats, peanut butter and sardines is used to lure the woylie. Later that night, they will return to check on the traps. But capturing the woylie is no easy task. The first few traps are empty. Very quiet so far. Yes. It looks like it's going to be a long night for the helpers. The woylie may be elusive, but its nocturnal relatives aren't so shy. High in the tree is a ring-tailed possum. And a chudich, a small carnivorous marsupial. Finally, they're in luck. The first woylie is trapped. The animals are taken back to the research station where the helpers record vital data. Okay. Okay. That's 1.75. They are such a difficult am animal to deal with. And I think it has to do with their temperament. You only have to watch them for a little while. They're quite hyper, and that's how they behave when you try and actually catch them. This woylie is pregnant, so the helpers are extra careful not to stress her. Can you see the One of the things the woylie will do when it's trapped, because it can't escape, it'll adopt its survival mechanism, it'll abort its young in the trap. <laughs> You feel sick if, if something goes wrong in terms of you trying to, to actually uh, study these animals and get the information you need to be able to conserve them. In the morning, the woylies are returned to the bush. 
As well as Mark's team, there are other helpers, but not of the human kind. This pea plant contains a poison known as 1080. It's deadly to humans and feral predators, but not to the woylie or other native wildlife. These animals are, are foraging around areas where this plant is producing all of this 1080. They probably ingest a little bit of it, and if that animal that ingests a bit is unlucky to be taken by a, by a fox, uh, you find that the toxin is so toxic it will kill the fox. And that's why these animals just manage to hang on. Very fortunate, very lucky. Thanks to Mother Nature and animal helpers like Mark and his team, the Wiley now has a bright future. After the break, the mighty elephant, tiny cousin. And how our cows are reacting to the loss of their horns. The goldfish is one of the most common pets in the world. But there's more to keeping this humble fish healthy and happy than putting it in a bowl of water and remembering to feed it. Animal Allies Guide to Keeping Goldfish Alive. Rowan Farris is having trouble looking after his goldfish. He's come to fish expert Patrick Smith for some help. So, Rowan, you're in for another goldfish. How many have you gone through now? Three. Three. Let's walk through what you should do to keep your bowl healthy. Okay, then, let's The set more up this room goldfish first. have to swim in, the happier they are. This water must be changed regularly. Rowan has only been changing his fish bowl's water three times a year. Basically, everything that you feed your goldfish is going to poop it out and it's going to stay in the water. By changing, say, a third to a half of your water once a week, you're keeping your goldfish happy. Goldfish can live up to 20 years and grow to a decent size if their living environment is not stressful. In this size bowl, you should only really have one or two little fish because it's not a very large area and there's nothing actually putting air into the water for your fish. Oxygen can be added by using an oxyblock, which slowly dissolves, releasing bubbles into the water. To keep your fish living longer, it's also vital to feed them a healthy diet. A pinch of food once a day is enough. You might want to stick in a couple of plastic plants or ornaments. Basically, you just stick these into the gravel. You can stick some forms of live plants in there, although it's not recommended to stick your garden plants in there. But plastic plants generally with a bowl are easier to look after and maintain because they don't require any light. So to keep your goldfish healthy, remember this week's Animal Allies how-to. Change the water regularly. Feed a balanced diet once a day. Make sure the bowl is not overcrowded with fish. This is one of South Africa's most recognisable tourist attractions, Cape Town's beautiful Table Mountain. Visitors from all over the world flock here for the breathtaking views. But they are often surprised by the unexpected welcome they receive from one of the locals. This furry fellow is the Rock Hyrax, nicknamed the Rock Rabbit in English or the Dussie in Afrikaans. One of the Dussie's greatest fans, zookeeper John Spence, has been admiring them since he was a schoolboy. They've probably been on the top of Table Mountain here, up and down the sides, for uh, well, since time began. And they live in crevices in the rocks and they're very agile, as you've been able to see. They are vegetarians by trade, they don't eat any meat or anything like that. They've become very habituated to the tourists up here on the, on the top of Table Mountain come up a cable way and they're almost waiting for you. And that's just the first surprise that Dussie has in store for visitors. Even more of a shock is their amazing heritage. A study of the Dussie's family tree reveals the most unlikely relatives. The relationship between the Dussie 
and the elephant. And I've always smiled to myself quietly about that one and never quite believed it. I mean, you couldn't get animals more that look less like each other if you tried. So I started looking up to find out, you know, and discovered that it actually goes back to 60 million years ago, which is quite a long time. There's only one person to talk to about the history of animals that far back in time, a paleontologist, a scientist who specialises in studying fossils. So John drove to South Africa's West Coast Fossil Park, two hours north of Cape Town, to meet old friend Philippa Horoff. Hi, John. Hi, Good how are you? Good to see you. Wonderful. Yeah, a long time no see. The West Coast Fossil Park was once an open-cut mine. In the 1930s, it supplied minerals for making explosives. In fact, much of the munitions exploded in World War II originated here as rock phosphate. But now the abandoned mine yields a much more peaceful resource, evidence of past life on Earth. And we've got over 200 different kinds of animals and well over a million specimens. Um, that makes this one of the richest sites in the world. Windows in the past that are opened up to us through operations like this help us, uh, help, helps inform us of, of the different kinds that, that lived way back in time. We have um, fossil remains of both those animals, two kinds of elephant, one kind of dussy, and their history goes way back in time. We think they had what we call a common ancestor, in other words, an animal that gave rise to both the dussies and elephants, going way back 40, 50, 60 million years ago. People don't, are, are, are surprised when they hear that dussies and elephants have a, have a connection. Yeah, I've seen a lot of people raise their eyebrows about that one. Yeah. The similarities, evidently, with, uh, between dussies and elephants are more in the feet and in the genes. And um, the tusks. Link the two. And yeah, the, yeah, the teeth are also in sizes as opposed mm. to, uh, the same with the in, uh, elephants. They're a lot so, smaller though, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> There's a huge difference in size. Yeah. Yeah. It started off with a family of animals called pine ungulates, which were herbivores. And the, the dasses went one way, the elephants went another way. So they're still all herbivores. Yeah, but they're very, very, very distantly related. I mean, 60 million years is a long, long time. With its origins now firmly established, John wants to make sure the Dussie or Rock Hyrax has a bright future. So at Tigerberg Zoo near Cape Town, Suki the Dussie gets plenty of encouragement to show off to the public. People don't even know if you, if you um, walk around with her, people ask you, oh, what is that? And you'll say, it's a rock hyrax. Oh, but what is that? You know, so not, not a lot of people actually know them because I think because they're so, so shy. But with a born performer like Suki on top of things, that low profile isn't likely to last for long. Back on the farm, Hampshire vet Doc Celia Newlove has a tough job on her hands, but a necessary one. The cow's sharp horns are dangerous to other cows and to people, especially in confined areas. A saw wire is used to cut through cow's tough horns. And hot iron cauterizes the wound, reducing blood loss and drying out the wound, which helps to minimize the risk of infection. I guess they're only really superficial blood vessels, so. She wouldn't bleed to death or anything to it. Okay, sweetheart. Okay. Cool. And I'll just give a bit of a, so just a, an antibacterial spray, really. Try and keep, dry it up and keep it clean. Stop the flies getting to it. You're halfway along there. And just get some uh, flips around there. Now it's the student vet's turn. In a few minutes, the cow will lose all sensation in this area. Good, you know. Give him a bit of haircut so we can see what we're doing. And we're going to set five years here. Hair 
is snipped back from around the horn rod to expose it, and it also means less smoke. Yeah, you... it helps keep the ear out of the way. You, often when you're doing it, somebody holding it, the ear helps you steer a bit as well. The student vet meets the challenge. Good. Ready. Right, what you want to do next year is come about a month earlier when David's got about 40 to do. <laughs> yeah, it's going to turn up at the end, isn't it? Right, well done. Yeah, well done. That takes a bit of a to dog. Suffering a little headache, the calf will be back to its normal self soon enough. Good, well, thanks for that. Very efficient operation, as usual. The day's work may be over for these animal doctors, but for Doc Newlove, it's just beginning. In the next programme, Animal Allies meet a prehistoric looking snapping turtle rescued from a maze of subterranean drains. And in South Africa, animal doctors take on a jumbo-sized medical problem.